Thank you po sa inyong patuloy na pagsubaybay sa Revelation series. Uh, ang ating pong pag-aaralan ngayon ay Revelation of Jesus Christ, the Sure Deliverer. Uh, sagot dun sa huli nating episode kung sino ang makakatayo sa pagsubok. Bago po tayo magpasimula, tayo manalangin. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this continued study in Revelation as we open up the ceiling a very important part of the last days. May we understand what it means to be sealed in Jesus. And may you move our hearts so that we can be assured that we can be sealed in Him. Possession and preservation in the last days. I pray. Amen. Review po tayo sa ating pinag-aralan. Last time, na-cover natin ng seven seals. Okay? Kung matatandaan ninyo, ang seven seals ay merong four horsemen of the apocalypse tinatawag. There was a white horse, there's a red horse, there's a black horse, and there's a pale horse. Uh, ang sequence ng events na to ay nagpapatunay that the enemy was active attacking the church. And so, while the church was going down and declining, Beginning with uh, seal number 5, 6, and 7, it goes on the rebound. And the rebound says the souls under the altar are pleading for God's intervention. And we see the reformation coming so that there's a restoration of the truth that has been covered by the first four seals. And number 6 talks about the second coming and the events leading to the second advent of Jesus. And number 7 is silence in heaven. What will ha- transpire when uh, Jesus has come to earth, and we will talk about that later on, it will be about the millennium and the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, let's uh, like, look at this very closely. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? That was the question left in Revelation 6:17. The great day of the wrath, the wrath is the judgment that that, ju- that God will exact upon those who do not believe in the gospel of Jesus. And the question is, when this judgment come, who is able to stand? Uh, who will not be affected, in other words? Chapter 7 is an interlude between the 6th and the 7th seal. It answers the question in Revelation 6:17. Let's review. What's the 6th seal? The 6th seal is the second coming, and the 7th seal is the silence in heaven. And there's a question in between this, who shall be able to stand? And our chapter, the first part of chapter 7, answers the question. There's a literary device that John employs, and he uses this, and and you will see this more as we look into the subsequent chapters in Revelation. It is what we call looking both ways. It looks backwards and it looks forwards. John introduces the sealing of God's people and the concluding question of the sixth seal. He doesn't just start with the sealing. He begins. He looks back at the sixth seal, which is the second coming of Jesus, and then he proceeds with the sealing of God in chapter 7. How do we begin this? Um, I know you can remember where you were exactly when... Uh, September 11, 2001 hit us. Uh, I can remember we were wa- working in, uh, in the office while we were busy going into all our software development and maintenance. Our boss came around and said, uh, if you guys want to go home, you can go home. Uh, it, he didn't say it right away. He actually said it when the second tower imploded. Yeah, exploded. Just collapsed. It's amazing that uh, in a matter of hours, two zip codes in the United States were wiped out by these horrific acts of terrorism. And terrorism has wreaked an unimaginable havoc and jumped national boundaries and the world has never been the same. How many of you have been to the airport lately? May see your hands. It's very difficult to go to the airport now. It used to be there are no security checks. But like uh, we'll be flying back to where we came from that will entail several stopovers. And every stopover that we go to, there's a security check, even body scans, in order to make sure 
that those in the plane are safe. Why? Because we cannot predict when the terrorists will attack again. And better safe than sorry, what we do is we have to protect the passengers of the plane in battling terrorism. The world is getting to be really worse as we look around. There's one explanation that one writer said. Uh, actually, the, she's the daughter of Billy Graham. If she were a man, she'd probably be the heir apparent of Billy Graham. But uh, uh, Anne Graham Lotz is the daughter of Billy Graham. And she concluded this after September 11. For years, we've been telling God to get out of our schools, to get out of our government, and to get out of our lives. And being the gentleman that he is, I believe he has calmly backed out. How can we expect God to give us his blessing and his protection if we demand he leave us alone? There is really even a move in the United States to take away the phrase, in God we trust, in the currency of the U.S. Why that is, is even uh, some people in the States are saying, it makes me vomit when I read the name of Jesus. Uh, while they're rebuilding Ground Zero in New York after that 9-11 attack, uh, they wanted to preserve a crossbeam. If you remember the crossbeam, the crossbeam was uh, were the beams of two beams of steel that the rescuers found. And it was in the shape of the cross. And the shape of the cross served as an inspiration for the rescue workers to retrieve more bodies and save more lives after 9-11. Uh, and the Atheist Association of America said, <laughs> it makes me sick when I see the sign of the cross in Ground Zero. But they can tolerate the establishment of Muslim mosque a few blocks away from Ground Zero. Can't understand what's going on. <laughs> and Graham Lott said, this is what we get for getting God out of our culture, God out of our nation. We wreak havoc among ourselves. Actually, God doesn't need to punish us. Just, God can just leave us alone without protecting us, and we can kill ourselves. How does that happen? How many of you know this guy? He's probably a favorite of mine. He, he's still a genius when it comes to comedy. He's the best uh, ad-libber when it comes to a stand-up uh, comic, not only stand-up comic in interviews and whatever uh, humorous act you can think of. Uh, Robin Williams was in parallel. And late one afternoon, while I was finishing up work, I overheard my office mate, who happens to be a Lutheran minister, uh, talk to his daughter. Have you heard? Robin Williams is dead. I was surprised. I was shocked. You know, of all people, I didn't expect Robin Williams to be dead. He was full of life, full of laughter. He was really happy. But what actually happened? They found him hanged. He hanged himself in his house and committed suicide and was gone. I read a lot of articles about the death of Robin Williams, trying to find some answers that may be relevant in the Christian life. And I can share that because it was so fresh. And one of the articles that I read was very gripping. Associated Press, 8 11, 2014, said Beneath that reservoir of frenetic energy and seemingly endless good humor, recited demons so dark they could push Robin Williams to suicide. John Belushi was one of the best actors of Saturday Night Live, a comedian too, a close friend of Robin Williams, and both of them were drinking a lot into alcoholism and doing drugs. And when John Belushi died of overdose, Robin Williams got scared, and he got rid of drugs, he got rid of alcohol, and Somehow his family came together, and there was a little bit of restoration, and then he went back. And uh, after he went back, he started getting into alcohol again, some drugs, and family fell apart. And after that, we hear about the suicide of Robin Williams. So I was starting to look into this. What was the problem? Was he a codependent because of his alcohol and drug habit. He pushed him into killing himself. Really, according to Associated Press in a lengthy article, which I have no time to post here, said that in the mind of 
Robin Williams. There were demons so dark bugging him. So he was actually drinking and he was taking drugs, not because of codependency. Maybe that's part of it. But he was doing this in order to drown the voices that was making tricks in his head. Only proves that the enemy is alive and well trying to play around with their minds. And unless you get protection from Jesus Christ, even the best of the best and the strongest of the strongest can be lured by the enemy into destruction. As if that's not enough, remember this, May 21, 2011. Harold Camping said that will be the end of the world. And there were couples all over the world. They were selling their possessions because there's no need to live beyond May 21, May 21 because Jesus is coming back May 21. The rapture will happen. And of course, a lot of people got flustered. Some people laughed at this. Uh, what really hit me was when I read this news. There was a girl, a 14-year-old girl from central Russia, Nastya Zakinova. She committed suicide, allegedly because she was afraid of the upcoming doomsday predicted by the American radio preacher Harold Camping. An innocent 14-year-old listening to a false prophecy took her life away. So there's dangers when we do not interpret Revelation properly. Give you more evidence. Um, Hillbop brings closer closer to Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate was a group of people. Uh, it was a day, I think that was March 26, 1997. They found, police found bodies of 39 members of the Heaven's Gates that were systematically wrapped in garbage bags. Uh, and I guess the way they implemented the strategy based on their leader was a certain group of people killed the group first, put them in the garbage bag, and closed them up. The whole idea was for them to be ready, because unless they die, they won't be able to board the UFO, the unidentified flying object, which will be at the tail end of the hell bob comet. It's, and they said each garbage bag, based on the, uh, in the investigation, had uh, about $5.75 in a passport because they needed a passport and they needed the $5.75 in order to board the unidentified flying object. What in the world are these people thinking? Just because they want to escape Earth, they're willing to die and they're willing to do something really dumb, if you may want to think about it. Driving it closer to home, David Corres. Okay, well, this is the, David Corres claimed that he was the antitype of King Cyrus that he was prefigured by Solomon, providing the rationale for his numerous collection of wives. He also claimed to be the lamb of the book of Revelation. You know the story of David Karest. He was actually from the Adventist church. And according to records, he was able to memorize chapters and chapters of the books of the Spirit of Prophecy by Ellen White. And he, got, he gathered a ton of people to join with him and you know the fateful end of uh, his group in Waco, Texas. There was a, a fireball that happened and they died in the compound because they wouldn't surrender. These are proofs that somehow if we are not careful, we can be deceived, we can be misled. It, it can be fatal, not just hurtful in our experience. So Revelation 7 comes to us and says, there's a way I can protect you and I can preserve you with all the risks that you will encounter in the last days. And the way to do that is for me to seal you. If I put my seal on you, you'll find the protection and the preservation that you need. So let's go into the protection that the seal will bring to us. Let's read the passage. In Revelation 7, 1, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. So the, in the vision, John sees four winds. And when we talked about symbols, winds has something to do about strife. There are winds about to blow into the earth. I didn't quite understand this. I guess I, I had the taste of this when typhoons hit the Philippines when I was growing up here. But the devastation that winds can really do really hit home 
when I started seeing tornadoes hit the ground. If you've seen the movie The Twister, that's for real. Those winds are so strong it can pick up a semi, an 18-wheeler, a big truck, and throw it up in the air. Um, there was just a tornado that hit very close to where we live, about 60 miles north. And one day when I went home, when I went to the office, my office mate came to me, Bing, look at this. He showed me a clip of all the, 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 the houses that were destroyed and the trees that fell down. And he went there as a volunteer to help in the recovery of what the tornadoes did. But the winds can be very devastating. And in Revelation, the winds is not just a tornado or a typhoon, even as strong as Yolanda, if you remember the fury of Yolanda. These winds are so strong that it can blow against the world and can destroy the entire earth. And God tells four angels to hold the four winds of the earth. They, these winds are coming from four directions, the north, east, south, west. And when it hits the earth, it hits all the directions, the entire earth, and will destroy the earth. And God said, four angels, you hold back the winds of the earth. Do not let it go. I will release it one of these days. But before you do so, what do you need to do? And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. And what did he say? Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. I hope you're seeing the gravity of the picture. We have four winds about to blow in all directions that will even destroy the earth. The power to take this earth apart. And God said, hold back the winds of the earth. And the only way you can release the winds of the earth is when my people are sealed. What's the meaning of when my people are sealed? Until I mark the people who must be preserved by me, you cannot release those winds. There's a warning that there's a very big time of trouble that will come. But there's also the good news that God will preserve us if you'll be part of those who will be sealed. So the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. We apply again the principle of going to the Old Testament so that we can understand what Revelation is saying. If you read in Ezekiel 9.5, God was about to administer judgment and he commanded the prophet to say, Go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity or do not spare. Okay, the judgment is coming. But to the others he said in my hearing, Go through the city. Do not spare anybody, but spare the people whom I'm going to be sealing. Now let's go back to the Old Testament um, picture of the plagues, which will be the winds that will be about to hit the earth. And if we talk about the plagues in the Old Testament, we remind ourselves of what plagues? What country was hit? Egypt. Ten plagues. The deliverance of the children of Israel. There's a lot of plagues, and if, if I may recall it, I'd like to tell you that every plague that was administered by God to Egypt was against an Egyptian god. What was the first plague? It was turning the Nile into blood. Nile, the Nile River was one of the chief gods of the Egyptians. And all that God was saying in all the plagues was, I am a greater god than the Egyptian god. I am the only god to be worshipped. It's fascinating. If you take a closer study of this, it is all about worship. And all the plagues that God will be sending is to prove that he's the greatest god and no other god is like him. There's no difference when the winds of the plagues will hit the earth in the end. It is to prove that God is the real God. And in, how did the Pharaoh relent? The Pharaoh who didn't let the people go? He finally relented when the tenth plague was administered. That was the death of the firstborn. And the death of the firstborn killed the firstborn of every household in Egypt, including the cattle and the livestock. There's only one exception. If you had the blood on your doorpost, what happened? The death angel 
passed over you. So in the Philippines, when and the Independence Day in the Philippines, it's June 12th. For a while, it was July 4th. It's June 12th. In the United States, the Independence Day is July 4th. Um, I think in Mexico, it's Cinco de Mayo, May 5th. But for the Jews, what's the Independence Day of the Jews? It's Passover. That's the liberation from Egyptian bondage. And what is this Passover? Let's go and look at the story again. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. God said, I am about to send the most painful plague and inflict it upon Pharaoh. That's the death of the firstborn. Where all the firstborn will die. I got to warn you, you are not immune to the death angel. All the firstborn will die unless you follow my instruction. What is the instruction? To kill a lamb. After you kill the, blood, the lamb, collect the blood and dip something in the blood. And paint your doorpost with the blood of the lamb. When the death angel comes and the death angel sees the blood on your doorpost, he will not touch the firstborn and you will be safe. This is a reflection of what it means to be sealed. A seal is an identifying mark so that you can be bypassed by the judgment of God. And that's what Revelation 7 is saying. If anyone says that man can be justified before God by his own works, whether done by his own natural powers or through the teaching of the law without divine grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. I said this because the only way you can be sealed by God is if you have faith in Jesus Christ. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, you become a Christian. That's why you're a Christian. You are now identified as a follower of Jesus, somebody who believes in Jesus. And therefore, because you are saved by faith, then you are sealed and you are saved from the judgment. The teaching of the Mother Church in the Council of Trent says this, that if anyone says that men can be justified before God by his own works, whether done by his own natural powers or through the teaching of the law without divine grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be a curse because men cannot be saved outside of grace. Oh, this is amazing. I said, because when I grew up in a Catholic persuasion, um, my understanding of salvation is for me to participate in the sacraments. And the more sacraments I participate in, I am more saved. If I'm not saved enough, I go to a holding place which they call purgatory. And there's a lot of rituals I need to go to in order for me to go to heaven. It was not that easy to go to heaven because there was a lot of things to do. And then I read this in the Council of Trent at the Mother Church that I grew up in, says, hey, you are saved not by your works, but you're saved by grace. Oh, did I misunderstand? So I went and started reading the doctrinal catechism of the Catholic Church. It says, what is justification? It is a grace which makes us friends of God. Okay? Since it's a catechism, it's a question and answer. Can a sinner merit this justifying grace? Answer, no. He cannot because all the good works which the sinner performs whilst he is in a state of mortal sin are dead works which have no merit sufficient to justify. Whoa, did I miss it again? What is the Mother Church saying? The Mother Church is saying, you cannot be justified by good works. I thought I was being justified by doing good, participating in all those rituals and the sacraments. What's going on in here? So I read some more. It is an article of the Catholic faith that the sinner in mortal sin cannot merit the grace of justification. Is it an article of the Catholic faith? Answer, yes. It is decreed in the seventh chapter of the sixth session of the Council of Trent that neither faith nor good works preceding justification can merit the grace of justification. Three questions in the Catechism. It's very clear that salvation is only by grace. So you ask the question, we studied the seven seals, what was the need for the Reformation? Because the teaching of the Reformation is we're saved by grace. So we'll probe some more to understand that. Because this is critical in understanding what the sealing is. Why then do Protestants charge us with believing that the sinner can merit the remission of his sins? What's the answer? 
Their ignorance of the Catholic doctrine is the cause of this, as well as many other false charges. They never look into the actual teaching of the Catholic Church. That's why they charge the Catholic Church wrongly. You go to the Douay version. The Douay version is the Catholic translation of the Bible. The difference of the Catholic translation of the Bible, other than some of the syntax and some of the phrasings of the words, is that it's got more books than the 66 books that we have because it includes the Apocrypha. Anyways, the Douay version reads, The justification of which St. Paul here speaks is the infusion of sanctifying grace which alone renders a person supernaturally pleasing in the sight of God. But justification, that is an infusion of sanctifying grace, cannot be merited by us. It is an entirely gratuitous gift of God. I hope you're getting the difference. I didn't catch it right away. Let me try to help you. According to the teaching, you are not saved by works. You are only saved by grace. But what kind of grace saves you? It is an infused grace, a grace that you infuse into yourself. What's the meaning of infuse? If you can think of a gasoline station, you're filling up a car with gasoline so that the car can run. That's infusion. You're infusing, infusing gasoline into the car. So if you can think of yourself or your spiritual being as a car infusing grace is putting gasoline into your car. In other words, I need infused grace because only grace can save me. How do I get infused grace? How does grace get infused into my system? There are seven sacraments. It's the church. And if you participate in the sacrament, you will have more grace applied to you. Okay. Fair enough. If I participate in the sacraments, I will have grace and I will still be saved by grace. There's a problem. How many of you roam the streets of Manila during Lent season or the Holy Week? Who do you, what do you find in the streets of Manila? You guys are in Tagaytay, so you, you don't see. But you go to Manila, what do you see on the streets of Manila during Holy Week? We, we see flagellates, right? Flagellates are people who hurt their bodies. Um, used to be the editor of our school paper when I was in school, and it was when I was in college. And... Uh, I had the friend who became like a brother to me, who was a photographer for United Press International and was stationed in Clark Air Force Base. He went under depression, he eventually went to our school, and we became close friends, we studied the Bible together, but he became a photographer. And Dale was very keen at taking pictures, he was very, very creative, you can see it from him when, uh, when he took some pictures. And during one of the vacations, Dale went to Bataan. And he took some pictures. We, we put this in our yearbook. I can still remember the picture that he took. It was a picture of a man who crucifies himself every year for 15 minutes. Okay? And you can see in the picture the spike that went through that hand. And you can see the blood still flowing. And we put this in the, we, we called it Balintawak Memoirs because we were still in Baisa. Now you call it Silang Memoirs. But the picture that Dale took was there. And you know what this man does? He crucifies himself for about 15 minutes every holy week. After 15 minutes of crucifixion, they take him down, he goes back to his Baha'i Kubo, and he starts drinking San Miguel beer. Okay? He drinks the whole year, and he says, maybe after I drink all the whole year and do all the vices, I can be crucified for 15 minutes and I can pay for all my drinking by bad drinking habits. I, I, I'm not saying that's a valid concept, but, but basically that's the idea. If I commit a lot of sins, but if I flagellate myself, if I subject myself to rituals, I am able to save myself. So Martin Luther started asking the question, oh, maybe, maybe, just maybe I will find peace and forgiveness if I start lacerating my body. I go to, to do penance, and you know what he did? Because he went to St. Peter's Cathedral. He walked on the stairs of St. Peter's Cathedral, on his knees. And every step of the step, he was kissing the cross on the tiles of the steps. And nothing was working. Then one day, his superior heard some moaning in his quarters. And when they opened the door to his quarters, they saw Martin Luther lacerating his body. Because the question of Martin Luther is, if I am saved by infused grace, the question is, how much infused grace do I need? Seems like it's never enough. 
He said, I think even if I kill myself, I won't have enough infused grace to be saved by God. And that's where he read in Habakkuk and in Romans that faithful war cry that says, the just shall live by faith. The Reformation was born. You are not saved by infused grace. You are saved by the grace outside of you coming from God and by believing that grace in Jesus Christ. You are saved. Without any penance, without any flagellation, without any ritual, you are saved by faith alone. So Lafida, and that rang wild. And let me explain to you why that happened. Welcome to, let you read that. It's a place called Purgatory, a real place, Purgatory. And the guy who put this together is, uh, and by the time you get to Purgatory, there are two other places you can go to. Okay, you either go to heaven, or you go to hell, and the, the guy puts some humor there, go to heaven, you have another three miles, go to hell, you get six, 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 six miles, okay? And <laughs> the number of that, they cry. It's a place of purging or temporary punishment in which the souls of those who die in a state of grace are made, made ready for heaven. The mother church started teaching this doctrine that when you die, <laughs> there's really a staging place because if you don't have all your sins are forgiven, if you have not renounced a lot and you paid for all your debts, you don't go straight to heaven. You stay in purgatory first, your soul. And if you have enough merits, enough what they call indulgence, you will be able to go to heaven. I did not appreciate exactly what that indulgence is until we went to the Reformation Museum in Geneva. Uh, they didn't allow us to take pictures. I took this from <laughs> the internet. There was an actual, this is a record of an actual indulgence by Johann Tetzel, John Tetzel. Um, of course, it's in German. <laughs> I, can, I cannot translate it for you. Uh, I was having a tough time when we were in Switzerland. I can only hear German and French, okay? But let me give you an idea what an indulgence is. An indulgence is something you buy. You buy pardon. You buy forgiveness. If you got enough indulgence, your relatives dies, and he didn't or she didn't uh, pay for all her, her sins, you pay via indulgence. You sponsor a mass, you sponsor a sacrament, and there'll be payment for your sins. How was this implemented? There's a list of tariffs for various indulgences, yeah, because there's a union of church and state who implements and executes the law. It is the state that executes the law, and when you violate, it's not a violation, it's just not a crime, it is actually a sin. And in order for you to pay for your sin, these are the prices you need to pay. What are the prices you need to pay? If you kill a man, it's $1.75. If you want to rob a virgin, it's $2. If you give a mistress, it's $2.25. For all crimes, you want to be observed of all crimes, you got $12. These are for the poor people. And some people who are rich, if they go against the church and some edict of the church, they have to pay $500. But they played this game because they were building one of the largest cathedrals of history. They called it St. Peter's Cathedral. And the only way to raise money was to sell forgiveness. And there's a problem. Because forgiveness is free. You don't sell it. But they started selling forgiveness. And it resulted in so much corruption. That's why Martin Luther began the Reformation. Now let's look into this in terms of what the Bible says. According to the Bible, all men are in Adam. All of us were born in Adam. Okay? And when we are born in Adam, that means if Adam and Eve were sinners, what are we? We're sinners. Okay? I love my grandkid. I, I, I can hardly wait to go back so I can play with my grandkid again. Uh, since my grandkid is born to my daughter, is Filipina, uh, she's also born to a father who happens to be Irish, so she's Ivory Pino. We call him Ivory Pino. It's an Irish Filipino. Um, I've been, uh, care she's lovely, so, so, she's so pretty. And then after several months, I was carrying her, and my wife took her picture. All of a sudden, I look at the picture. This was a picture of uh, chocolate and milk. <laughs> because you can see my complexion as a Filipino, and you can see her complexion as an Irish. Just in my, my daughter has been teasing me, Dad, Dad, she's very putty. <laughs> it's very white. So uh, why? Uh, 
she's white because she came from an Irish. Why am I brown? Because I came from a Filipino. My son, who happens to play basketball, he's probably one of the best basketball players I know, at least in our area, is only as short as I am. He's only 5'6". Uh, but uh, he came to me one day, Dad, is there a way I can be taller? <laughs> no, I can't, because she came from me. You know, if I were tall, you'd probably be tall. What am I trying to say? You can only be you based on where you came from. Right? And if you came from Adam and Eve, they're sinners, you got to be sinners. So the only way you can resolve the issue is if you, didn't come, if you don't come from Adam and Eve. If you don't come from Adam and Eve, you must be out of this world. Okay? You must be an alien. But all of us came from Adam and Eve, so all of us have sinned. And remember this, we are sinners not because we do bad things. We do bad things because we are sinners. Did you get that? Don't reverse that, okay? Because we do not become sinners because we do evil or bad things. We are prone to evil because we are born in sin. We are sinners because our parents were sinners. So what was this gospel about? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The gospel says, somehow, Jesus was made sin for us. And when you open Revelation 14, 1, it said, and, so, and I saw and behold the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Clue number one, very important. If you were supposed to be sealed and there's the sealing of God, what is the seal defined? How is it defined in Revelation? How does it read right there? What's the seal? They will have what on their foreheads? The name of his Father. The name of God will be in the foreheads of what they call the group 144,000. Okay? The seal is the name of God. Oh, big deal. You know? Just, do you write Yahweh there? Do you write God? No. When we talk about the name in Hebrew, the name is special. They name you for who you are. I don't know who your name, what your name are, right, what your name is right now. But during the time of Jesus, when you are called a particular name, that's who you are. That's why what's the name of, what's the meaning of Jacob? Jacob means a supplanter, a liar. When you look at Jacob, you see a liar, okay? When you call him and Daniel, what does that mean? What does Daniel mean? Daniel is, my God is my judge. He's got discretion, okay? He's got the wisdom of God, okay? I don't happen to like my original name, okay, that's why it changed my name before, but it, it's not just name that counts, it's a name that stands for character. So when we say they have the name of God on their foreheads, they have the character of God on their foreheads. Are you following me? Now when we talk about the character of God, the character of God is who he is, how he acts. Question, was there ever a man on earth who was able to follow the character of God completely and perfectly? Was there one? Yes, it was Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was the exact reflection of God, the character of God. Therefore, when you get the name of God on your forehead, you actually get the righteousness of Christ on your forehead. Are you following me? The seal of God is the righteousness and the character of Christ on your forehead. What will mark you and identify you as someone belonging to God is the righteousness of Jesus that you have by faith written on your forehead. Let's look at the description. They will behold his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Look at the picture here. In the foreheads, here's the angel watching the character of God in the foreheads of the 144,000. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, if you may review, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. What does it say? You are saved by grace through faith. Not of yourself. It is what? A gift. What is the meaning of a gift? Do you do anything to receive a gift? Do you work for a gift? No, if you work for a gift, it ceases to be a gift. That's why it's given freely by grace to us. Salvation and the character of Jesus and perfection comes to us for free, through the grace of God. How do we get it? We get it by faith. We accept it with an open hand. It's not the result of work. So that who gets the glory, it's not you, but God. 
John 14, 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. When you look at me, you actually see the Father. And if we are supposed to have the Father's character on our foreheads, all we need to do is have Jesus in our foreheads, and we can have the seal of God. Jesus said to them, My food is to do of him who sent me and to accomplish his work in John 4, 34. You already saw this in the previous session, but this is the way the reformers, particularly Martin Luther, describe what it means to have the righteousness of Jesus in justification by faith. It is solus Christus, sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura, and soli Dei gloria. And I told you the difference between the mother church and the reformation is this. The mother church believes in grace, in Christ, in faith, in scripture, and glory. But they do not offend alone in the war Christ. They believe in faith, but it's not faith alone. They believe in grace, it's not grace alone. They always add something so that you might be accepted. The seal of God says, whatever you have in your forehead is given by grace through faith. You don't do anything. It's a free gift of God. It revolutionized the world in the Reformation. In 1814, some 1,200 people sought sanctuary in the Kagsawa Church, thinking that they would be saved from the fear of Mayan volcano's eruption. I think Mayan volcano is becoming active again. I remember flying over a Mayan volcano when I did an evangelistic series in Beagle. It was awesome to look at the world's perfect cone and flying over it. You know, I won't fly over it right now because it's kind of active. But when it erupted, remember in 1814, a lot of people say, oh, we're going to die because of all the lava flowing. So you know what we need to do? We got to go into the church. Maybe when we go to the church, we will be safe. No people, all 1,200 people who sought sanctuary in the Kagsawa church. And Biko died because he was buried under the lava of the erupting Mayan volcano. I gave this as an illustration because if you think you can be saved by a church, by a denomination, by a religion, think again, you cannot. You are not sealed by a church or a denomination or a religious body. You are sealed by the righteousness of Jesus that you accept by faith. It's very important to know that because till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. It was taken from the song. How much of my sin was paid for by Jesus Christ? Every sin that I have ever committed has been paid for by Jesus Christ. I always give this illustration. I thought when I did the seminar, I talked about Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was one of the worst criminals in history because what Jeffrey Dahmer did was he kidnapped a lot of young boys. He raped those boys. After he raped those boys, he cut them into pieces, stored the pieces of these boys into a freezer, and he started eating those boys. He was a murderer, he was a kidnapper, he was a rapist, he was a cannibal. And the judge said, you are not a man, you're a monster. Long story short, while he was serving his time in a high security prison in Wisconsin, according to the testimony, he met Jesus Christ and accepted Jesus Christ. Do you think Jesus Christ forgave Jeffrey Dahmer? If Jesus cannot forgive Jeffrey Dahmer, all of us will be in trouble. But that's amazing. Somebody, a monster like Jeffrey Dahmer, can be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, I don't know what has happened. What if Hitler... On his deathbed, before he died, however he died, some say he committed suicide, but just theoretically, if Hitler said, Jesus, forgive me, I killed six million Jews, will Jesus' blood cleanse Hitler from his sins? That's amazing. The same power that can forgive a Hitler and a Jeffrey Dahmer is available to anyone who accepts him. And when you accept that forgiveness, you know what happens? You are sealed by God. That's great news. That's why aside from the protection, it will be our possession. My Father has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I like to impress this very heavily on you. A lot of people do not have the security of salvation. I always ask them, what happens if Jesus were to come tomorrow, or you are called by God and you die? Are you sure that you're going to go to heaven? It's very difficult to answer that. I'll have an answer for you while in our study. If you have the seal of God, you'll be in heaven. 
Believe that? That's the news in Revelation. If you're sealed by the character, how do you have the seal of God? So I was preaching in one church in Chicago. After my preaching, this one man came to me and shook my hand and said, Thank you very much, Pastor, for coming today. I haven't been in church for the longest time, and I'm glad I came. I heard about the good news of Jesus Christ once more. Don't worry about me, Pastor. I'm holding on to Jesus Christ. I was about to leave. I turned around. I put my hand on his shoulders. I said, Sir, you can forget everything I said today, but do not ever forget what I'm about to tell you. And I tell you, do not forget what I'm about to say. Do not think of holding on to Jesus. Think of Jesus holding on to you, and he will never let go. I'm not playing with words. The reason why people do not have an assurance is they concentrate on what they can do rather than concentrate on what God has done for them. You think if he loves you on the cross, he's going to leave you alone. No, he loves you so much, he's going to take hold of you. And that's the strength of the seal available in Revelation 7. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Who resides in you? The Holy Spirit resides in you, so you can have the assurance that Jesus is your Savior. And you know what? There's a lot of uh, things happening right now. Before I left uh, uh, for, the, for Manila, we have a small Bible study group, and one of the challenges of the kids going to public school is Charlie Charlie. I don't know if you've done that in, here in Manila, but Charlie Charlie is like the Ouija board. You know, it gives you some answers and clues. You become clairvoyant. There's just spirits right there. And they're saying, oh, don't touch it. Because if you play with the devil, the devil will play with you. Okay, and some people are scared. Of, Can I be possessed by the devil? If I get possessed by the devil, will I have any chance to be saved? I got news for you. When you accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. You are the dwelling place of God. And the devil cannot go into you. You can never be possessed by the devil because you belong to Jesus Christ. That's the good news. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So the question, is it enough to say, hey, <laughs> I believe in Jesus, I'm sealed, uh, I'll be saved. Now, according to statistics, uh, over 50% over of the United States uh, population says they are born-again Christians. Okay? But of those population... Almost 70% says they do not need to read the Bible or go to church or pray. How will you treat somebody who comes to you and say, Hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I think I'm sealed. But I have no time to pray. I have no time to read the Bible. Will you believe him? Okay, now don't confuse what I'm trying to say. Somebody who has been saved by Jesus and who accepted the gospel, we love praying, we love studying the scriptures, we love worshiping God. Not in order to be saved, but because they have been saved. It only proves that Jesus is most precious to them. And somebody who doesn't care to pray, they're just faking you. They really don't have the seal of God. Remember, you are not saved by praying or reading your Bible. But you pray and read your Bible because you have been saved by somebody who gave everything to you. And I had a number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 144,000 is 12,000 times 12,000. And the 12,000 stands for the tribes of Israel. Uh, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000, it goes on and on. Reuben, God, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Isaac, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Okay, Dan and Ephraim are missing because of the apostasy and rebellion that they did. But suffice it to note, the 144,000 stands for the tribes of Israel. It's the symbol of perfection too. 12 and 7 are the symbol of perfection. And 12 times 12, 12,000 times 12,000 is 144,000. Lastly, we talk about the revelation of Jesus Christ and his preservation. Not only his protection, his possession, there's also his preservation. Having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. I like to express this in a very touching way. I'm so glad that while we're taping this, there were two volunteers uh, who will be helping edit this and do all the work here. And it so happens they just got married. 
and they got married, but they want to dedicate their talents here. But before they got married, what is the ritual? The ritual is a man goes to the girl, and on one knee, he asks the girl, will you marry me? Right? Uh, and for cultures that symbolizes this commitment through a ring, a man gets a ring and saves for the ring, and then puts the ring in the finger of the girl as a symbol that now she belongs to him. They're engaged. Nobody else can take the girl, and no one else can take him. That symbol, Arabon, that word, is the word used in this context. Having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like the wedding ring. Nobody can take you anymore. You belong to God. You are sealed. And God belongs to you. And with the gift of picture of what it means to be sealed in the Holy Spirit. It's a guarantee because you now belong in the Spirit. The Spirit himself testified with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. What does the Spirit say? What does it testify? We are children of God. And if children, heirs also. We are children and heirs. That's what the Holy Spirit says. You accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides in your heart. What will the Holy Spirit tell you? You belong to Jesus. You're his child and you're his heir. That's why the Holy Spirit seals you in Jesus Christ. Because you put your faith in the righteousness of Jesus in the gospel of our Lord. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. John first hears in the vision, and what he subsequently sees is actually one and the same thing. What he sees is actually the explanation of what he heard before. This is a literary device. You keep on seeing this in Revelation. If you want to look at the device again, he said, he first sees something. And the moment he sees something, he turns around and he says, that's an explanation. What is he standing before the throne and before the, lone, the, Lord, the Lamb, clothed in white robes and in palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. How in the world does John say there's only 144,000? And when he turns around, there's an innumerable. I cannot count. There are countless people. Simple enough. They're the same group. These are the sealed people before they went to the tribulation or before they went to the time of trouble. And when he turns around, the redeemed people, the same group that goes to heaven because they have been sealed by God. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be our God forever and ever. Amen. The same group which was the 144,000 before the winds were released will be the same group who will worship God before his throne in an innumerable number. If you look at the picture very closely, these are a gathering of the 12,000 from each tribe. And we, you ask the question, what is the 144,000 about? Remember, 12 is a symbol of perfection. And because 12 is a symbol of perfection, 12 tribes, the perfect number. So 144,000, a lot of people are asked, are they literal? It's not literal. It is only a symbol of perfection. Why is, not, why is it not literal? Because John saw 144,000. When he turned around, it was already countless. The most important thing is that those who will stand before the throne are the people who will be sealed. To close what we are studying today, I'd like to be able to relate a story that might uh, be able to tell you the power of the righteousness of Jesus and what sealing is all about. During the time of, uh, in the 1800s, there was a man who went to Cuba. He was of British origin, so he was a British citizen. And then he became naturalized as a U.S. citizen. So he had a dual citizenship, both British and American. And in the process of what was going on in Cuba, uh, there was a, an uprising. There was a rebellion. And they pinpointed him as to be one of the guys who was responsible. They dragged him to court. 
and the, the trial was in Spanish. He couldn't understand a single word of Spanish, although he was living in Cuba. And they sentenced him to death. Without him knowing exactly what transpired in the trial, he didn't even know the accusation, what was the charge against him, but they sentenced him, sentenced him to go to the firing squad. So when you're in a country and you don't know anybody, you don't even speak a language, where do you go? You go to the consulate because that's a representative of your country in another country. So he contacted the consul of the United States and the British government. And when they heard about it, he supplied documentation. He said, I am not doing anything wrong. And when the consuls of both Great Britain and America looked at the papers, indeed, this guy was innocent. Because this guy was innocent, they immediately called on the government of Cuba and said, why don't you release these two guys? They did not commit any crime. And then the leader of the government said, how dare you go against our government? We already tried them in our courts. We have a court system, and they're supposed to die. And since they were in Cuba, there were no internet then, there were no airplanes then. There was no time to go to the United Kingdom and to the United States of America to talk to the government to help absolve these two guys. Meanwhile, they dragged the two guys, they dug a grave, and after digging a grave, they blindfolded this guy, they covered him with a black hood, and the firing squad line up while he's standing on that wheelbarrow, and while we're about to shoot him, so that after they shoot him, he goes straight into the grave. The two consuls rode in their horses, and when they reached the site of execution, they dismounted their horse, carrying the flag of its country, and they ran to this man, and the British guy wrapped around the Union Jack, which is the flag of Great Britain. And the American consul took the Star Spangled Banner and wrapped the flag around this man. And they turned around and looked at the Cubans and looked at the firing squad and said, go ahead, shoot if you can. Because when you shoot this man, you will be shooting our countries. The man was set free. You realize in the last days, when the enemy is ready to line up his firing squad against you, Jesus will turn around, wrap you with his righteousness, and he will look at the enemy, go ahead and shoot. When you shoot, you shoot at me, and let's see who's going to win. Righteousness of Jesus is the seal that's available to anybody who will believe in him. So I pray to God even now as you listen that you will not depend on anything that you do. But submit to Jesus and in faith believe that everything has been given to you in him. And believe that he will hold on to you. He will never let go. And the winds of strife comes. You will be safe. Preserve in him. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the promise of the seal of God in Jesus Christ. I pray for each one listening right now. May they completely commit to you and surrender and have faith. And believe that in Jesus, they are children of yours and heirs of the promise and heirs of the kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.